Yeah, we all have challenges with technology. We're right, see? Cool. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, cranky throat. We'll get through it. Now I've taken the thing off. Messages from me, and being your 80th year, probably the first thing is that uh, all retailers in New Zealand are on the same side. We're trying to sell meat. We're trying to sell something of quality. So message number one is we're on the same side. Yes, we can be competing competitors in the marketplace, but we've got many, many more competitors out there. And they're the things that uh, I'll quickly touch on this morning. Uh, from the retailer side of things, first off, how are we going in our area? How are we going in our region? Interesting to see that the last 12 months, it's been pretty tough. And so far this year doesn't look much, much better. When you look at Asia, and how Asia is performing, there's a little old Australia struggling away as well. So, some interesting trends. New Zealand over time, we've had better growth times, and of course the last four, now I think it's now five quarters, business is pretty tough. Business is tough. But that's our market. That's our market. Uh, got a few slides on what's happening, and again, this is uh, home scan data, uh, thanks to Ethan Lamb. And what it talks about is what's going on in our category, how often consumers actually shop. And this is total market. Sometimes us retailers get hung up on about uh, ourselves and our major competitors. It's actually about total market what's happening in the total market. And if there's one thing, if you want a theme for the future, is what's the customer doing? And there is distinct customers, as we just saw there before, with David's illustration. Put your hand up, dial this number. Someone used the phone, the first guy they just listens literally, literally and just reads out the number. There's a big age thing coming. A big age thing coming, where people sub 35, uh, are, they grow up in a different world. They've grown up with the technology and they think about a telephone not as a telephone the way we do. They actually think about it as just a communication vehicle that they don't, quite often don't take to their ear. Very rarely, rarely ring somebody. This slide here is worth really thinking about because what this is talking about is 96% of people in the last year have bought beef. 95% of people in the last year in the home scan data had purchased chicken. Right? And only 83% of people in New Zealand had purchased lamb. Very, very sobering. You know? When Todd was a young boy, chicken would have been way down there on that list, wouldn't it Todd? 3%, right? So, look how that has changed. Look how that has changed. And of course, that one there would have been as high as beef. Would have been as high as beef. Higher than beef. Higher than beef. Yeah. There you go. Interesting. Pork. 88% of people pork. Steady performer. Um, then of course, we go into random weight meats, bacon, and so on. Look at the participation though, an area of opportunity, an area of opportunity. Then you have a look at this one, which correlates the growth, 2012-2013, year on year, well, which is 2011, sort of go through, decline in beef, decline in chicken, aberration in lamb. I say aberration because at 83%, and Todd said it was higher than 96, 97, you know, aberration. Consistency of pork and splattering there of what's happening in the rest of the areas. Where do, you, where do people shop for meat? 
22, 25% non-supermarket, 75% supermarket. And that trend's reasonably steady and stable. Here's another interesting one. And introduced you to the word of protein. Protein, we're protein sellers. And the bigger retailer you are, the more protein you sell. We'll talk more about that. Beef over time, steadily growing in price. Lamb, 2008. The world changed for lamb in 2008, five years ago. And what's happened to lamb in the last five years is a real concern, and it should be a real concern for this country. Chicken, poultry, stable, reasonably stable. Fish, nicely going through. And pork, very, very consistent. And of course there's the peak on lamb. It's come off a little bit, hence the growth in sales. But if you read some of the charts, it looks like lamb is turning around. No, it's just an aberration. Barriers to entering or why you don't eat beef or lamb. I'm not going to go through every single one. But there's some interesting things there. Talking about pack size. Talking about don't know how to cook it. Don't know how to cook meat. Yeah. To me, that's a lame excuse. But for a sub 35 year old, could be valid. Could be valid. What are we doing about that? That's a question. That's a question. And whether it is beef or lamb, because I think lamb's actually got a, a tougher road to hoe. Beef, I think it's got a, a reasonably a good story, especially in this country, but there's a lot to learn from that graph. Are they going out to eat more? That's basically saying, no, not really. When they go out, they're not, not actually eating going out to eat beef or going out to eat lamb, and in the case of lamb it's actually it's not even on the menu a lot of times. It has been off the menu a lot. Eighty years ago, did you want to grow up to be a protein farmer? Who in here had aspirations to be a protein farmer when they grew up, when they were a young kid? Nobody? Oh, you did? Okay. What sort of protein? Beef. Beef. Okay. So to be a beef farmer or a cattle farmer, that was aspirational. What have we done by calling it protein? All right. Now David should be able to help me out here because David's an accountant from memory. All right. What's the great thing about accounting? Personality. Personality. <laughs> All right. That is the greatest thing. Their personality is consistent, right? <laughs> they're boring bastards, right? <laughs> but they're factual, right? Is meat protein? Yes. So some accountant somewhere in the world, some politically correct person has said, meat is protein. Let's call it the protein category, right? Now I had a meeting here a couple of months ago with a lady from the UK. And what do you do? And she says, I'm the, I look after the protein for weight trucks. And of course I had to stop and think. I wanted to meet the lady because I knew she was doing some work with uh, Liam out of NZ. But she looks after protein for weight trucks. All protein. How exciting does that sound on your business card? Right. Now, David be happy. It's 100% correct. But this is what we've done. We've gone from the traditional British, more or less, meat and three veg, to this politically correct stuff. Where we've got protein, veggies, and downsizing the meal and what all those sort of things. How exciting is that? When you think about it, we're turning food into basically something we have to have to sustain ourselves. That is true, but shouldn't there be some romance? Shouldn't there be some en enjoyment, some passion and pride? But that's where we're going. That's where we're going. And of course, uh, the Chinese are recognising that because they're working out how they can actually get their protein to feed their 1.2, 1.3 
million people. So, protein farmer. Boring. But that's our challenge. The problem is, when you start calling it protein, look who else you're introducing. Look who else you're introducing. You're introducing baked beans, chickpeas, lentils, soybeans, tofu, and so on and so on. So we're broadening the market. We're lessening the opportunity for sale of fresh meat. So, and of course, uh, vegetarians, there's quite a deal of change there. Of course, I've left off their cheese. Cheese also. Then you have a look at this. Great story on lean beef. And lean beef in this country is as good as any lean beef anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. Uh, but it's up against other proteins. And of course, there's the cheapest protein of all, eggs. And the egg story in this country is actually quite a good one. Some of the safest chickens uh, in, the, in the world. The least disease in the world is in chickens in this country. Leads us to another thought. Grass fed versus grain fed. It's interesting. Yeah. And when you think about the US, grain fed predominantly. Australia, a large percentage grain fed. The consumer and restaurants here in NZ have grain fed and grass fed beef. What's better? Eating quality, very hard to pick the difference. If anything, uh, grain fed tastes brutal. But is there a story in grass fed? I think there is. I think there is. It's an opportunity. What's New Zealand named for? Clean and green. And it used to be, 10 years ago, lamb. New Zealand lamb was regarded as amongst the best lamb in the world. It's lost its way. It's lost its way. It's lost its way globally, but it's lost its way in this country. And where does tourism fit in? Tourism is uh, two, three, four, number industry in this country. When tourists come to New Zealand, we should be selling them lamb. In our restaurants, we should be selling them lamb everywhere. What have we done? In 2008, we lost our way. We lost our way of where one of the prides and joys of NZ was mismanaged. We let land become a commodity. When you let things become a commodity, you get that. So the UK, sorry, the Europe, Europe is, and the European retailers, they're, they're nice, aggressive guys. They just keep driving cost out. Keep driving cost out. And, you know, they've found horse meat in like 21, 22 different styles of food over there. It's not if this was one isolated example. They've actually found it uh, yeah, in quite a lot of European products. What does that do? What did it do to Findus? What did it do to IKEA? It killed the total market. So when I first said that we were all going to say all in this together, guess what? We are. Because if we stuff up in a market, we stuff the total market. Now, not an issue in this country, not an issue in this country. But boy, thanks to the social media, thanks to the media, that hit the world headlines within hours. Within hours. And it's still going on. Also, there was an article about it in the paper yesterday. Oh, sorry, it's Thursday. Then, <coughs> bird flu. What if bird flu gets to other parts of the world? What does that do? A week ago, I was in Shanghai, that's why I'm sick. <laughs> I know you won't come near me now. Uh, basically, no chicken on the menu. Anywhere in Shanghai. And guess what, I wasn't going to be eating chicken anyhow, let me tell you. I stayed right away from it. But 
bird flu, those sort of things are going to really worry us. And of course, you know, animal care, animal husbandry is also very important in pork and then of course the consumer is telling us in poultry, in chickens. Where does it go to in beef? Where does it go to in lamb? It's actually can change to something different there where it can be what we feed them, how we look after them. So husbandry of product is so, so important. And of course, you know, pre-cooked sausages here, we'll worry about that. Can't sausages, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so good. Yeah, yeah, so. How you can take so much out and still call him a sausage? He wouldn't call him a sausage. An accountant couldn't call him a sausage. It may be in the form of a sausage, but yeah, we won't go there. Vertical integration, uh, understanding where a product comes from, understanding where a product's, how a product's been looked after, uh, cared for, what it's been fed, where that's happened is going to be very, very important. Is that traditional? Is that modern? What is it? The reality is it's the world's going round. You want to know where something comes from. So traceability is very, very important. And traceability is important for us as a business, and I think traceability is important for us as an industry. So, and that's going to go through every single part of our industry. We do it ourselves, and of course, uh, uh, the Angus program is an old one, but we can, with this, it's something we've been doing for some time. Our model has moved from a traditional model to a cert, certainly in the North Island is a, a fully integrated vertical integration model. Uh, and of course that's our plant that was opened in 2004, so it's nine years old. Right? It's not something new, you might think, oh my god, but it was one of New Zealand's best kept secrets. Uh, we had some trouble commissioning for some time, but working well for us now. And of course that goes straight through to our supermarket. That gets us consistency, it gets us uh, traceability. It doesn't get us the rest, and that's something we haven't told our story very well. That's something we've got to work on. Yes, we get through a bit of volume, and we source obviously more or less 100% anything New Zealand is grass-fed. Stores. Stores are changing, so I think uh, the size of stores is changing as well, in that in time, stores are going to get smaller, not bigger. Uh, so, you know, our stores, some of our stores are too big. Uh, it's actually about having something fresh, having something appropriate for its local market. So our stores are changing in size, and of course, our virtual or online business is an important part of our offer in this country, and that's not going to change.